to Future Proof and Sansi, a podcast where we discuss how consumer behavior shapes our marketing plans. I'm Senna. And I am Tash. I'm a colleague of Senna's at Cantor, and today I'm filling in for Stacey as one of your hosts. On this podcast, we interview the most creative minds and innovative thinkers about the many impactful brands in the country and why people love them. We discuss what makes South Africans tick, why they do the things they do, and what those things are. Most importantly, through our discussions, we offer practical advice for how to build the brands of tomorrow. So firstly, I want to welcome you, Tesh. You're stepping in for Stacey. Stacey is once again traveling out and about, spending time with clients that we love. So <laughs> I'm super excited to have you. Um, so welcome uh, to my colleague for the listeners. This is Tembek Azi Ndamase joining me here today, affectionately known as Tesh. I'm so happy to be here. I can't wait to get stuck in today's interview as we have a fantastic guest joining us in studio today. That's right. So over the previous episodes, the subject of influencers has continuously come up. We discussed it with Mike Sharman, who has created some amazing influencer campaigns over the years. Mm. We also touched on it in our sustainability episode and in our Gen Z episode, where we spoke about the kinds of influencer marketing this generation wants to see and how important it is for influencers to align with the brand's values. I love the Gen Z episode and how our colleague Yasmin Kathoria uh, spoke about uh, how she doesn't like the word influencer. She said that organizations should rather focus on the human being. In other words, who are the friends and extended family of the brand and who are the people that share their values as a brand and who can create with them? And so today, we decided that we like to hear from an actual influencer, I mean, like an actual human being, so that you can get a better insight of how you should be engaging with these content creators. Our guest is a South African entrepreneur, a journalist, a motivational speaker, and a good news thought leader. He owns South Africa's top good news site and was one of the fortunate four journalists in South Africa who were invited to have a lunch with Oprah last year. He has been named one of the top 100 most influential young South Africans by Mail and Guardian and was GQ's Man of the Year. And his platform was featured in on a list of world's top 100 innovational, innovation success stories. Brent Lindeke, we are absolutely thrilled to have you on Future Proof Zanzi. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, what an incredible honor to be here. Um, I know we're going to have a really interesting conversation about influencers and, and future-proofing brands and, and sort of where we go and, and how we work together to, to make sure that the brands are getting the, uh, the exposure that they, that they need on all of these social media platforms. So thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Brent. Okay, I'm going to like completely try and hide and conceal the fact that I'm starstruck. So <laughs> anyway, but let's kick things off. Uh, I want you to tell us a little bit more about yourself. We know that you have a great story about how you got to where you are today. But for our listeners who don't know your journey, could you tell us about how you came to be known as the good things guy? Yeah, look, it's a, it's a long story. So I'm going to try to do like the elevator pitch so I don't take up the whole show with, uh, with how Good Things Guy was, was born. But, but 10 years ago, there was a social media trend that started down in Australia. It was called Neck Nominations. It was the biggest social media trend uh, to use social media as a catalyst to grow itself. So before the ALS bucket challenge, before all of those sort of things popped up on social media, this was the first one. And it was this whole stupid idea to drink as much as you possibly could uh, and then and then video yourself doing something silly um, and nominating your friends to outdo what you'd done. There were millions of videos being uploaded from all around the world. And I was watching this from here in South Africa. And I just thought, man, imagine we could do something better with our social media. Imagine we could, uh, I don't know, make make this journey that we have in this world easier for, for each other. Uh, and so I got nominated. And instead of drinking, I decided to feed a homeless person. Um, I, I didn't have a social media following at the time. Uh, but I, I posted this video of me sort of changing neck nominations into a random act of kindness. I thought maybe it would inspire one or two of my friends to do the same thing. And, and I woke up the next morning and I'd, I'd gone viral. I was all over uh, the newspapers and news sites all around the world. Um, the BBC's, the Sky News, it was really an absolute surreal thing. But what had happened overnight is people had seen my video and they'd been inspired to do the same. So from that point on, 
uh, neck nominations became known as rack nominations. And, and it thrust me into a different space where for the first time in my life, I, I was being uh, exposed to really good news stories. So people had found my details. They, they wanted to tell me about the good work that they were doing for some reason. They were like, this guy's doing good things. We need to tell him about the good stuff that we're doing. Um, and, and yeah, I, I really felt proudly South African in that moment when, when I was listening to all these good news stories for days and weeks on end. And I knew that I had to do something with it. So, so that's where the seed was planted. Uh, it took a year. I was on Cliff Central uh, telling those good news stories. And in that time that I was there, I launched Good Things Guide com and 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 that site has has now become uh, South Africa's top good news site but he has an interesting thing that I actually I've, I've you know I've done interviews for years he has an, he has an exclusive that I haven't really spoken about the good the good things guy and where where goodthingsguy.com comes from uh, it's it comes from when I started working in corporate uh, 20 years ago and and I didn't quite know how to end my emails um, you know like kind regards what do you say what do you say at the end of the email? Um, and I decided on on wishing you only good things because I wanted the receiver of my email to receive it with kindness, and and that's where the good things name sort of was born from, and 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 the, the seed was planted with neck nominations. Ah, such a wholesome story! Like as you're telling that, you just—it's so infectious. You can't help but just burst out into the biggest smile. I want to jump into brands, okay? I would really like to know how did you go about in deciding which brands to align with, um, so that the partnership and content comes across as authentic. So the biggest thing, there's two facets to who I am because it's Good Things Guy as a platform, which is the media uh, news site, which is, the traffic there is insane. And it's really, it's, it's South Africa's top good news site. We, we, we're part of the media world. And on the other hand, I've got my brand, Brent Lindicu, where my social media started to grow, where brands want to align either with Good Things Guy or with myself, really. Um, and, and so it's important to know which brands fit where. Um, good Things Guy as a platform is all about good news. It's all about sustainability. It's all about CSI projects. So when we look at brands to partner with and to keep Good Things Guy running, it's all about that good work that the brand is doing. I wouldn't put a brand on the site. I wouldn't allow them to be on the site if... Um, if they were flash in the pan, if their stuff wasn't sustainable, if they weren't working towards goals that are really going to improve and change South Africa. On, on my side, um, I like to work with brands that are fun. Uh, the same sort of thing when, when it comes to, to doing good. I think it's important to have that, that authenticity in that space um, because it is part of my brand too. And so selecting brands is all about do they fit with Good Things Guy and do they fit with Brent Lindicu? And the answer there is if they don't, then I just won't work with them. I think that's, uh, you know, those values alignments is something that, again, you're speaking about. It's so important. And I, I, I've seen brands sort of blanket approach just because an influencer has a large following, um, but the values don't necessarily align. What do you think is the risk of that approach of just following the numbers where there isn't a value alignment? You know, it's difficult because what ultimately do you want to achieve as a brand? So do you want to align with an influencer that you can tick the box and say, that influencer with X amount of followers gave us X amount of exposure? Because then tick the box, you've done it. Or do you want to work with an influencer where the message that you're sending out is real? And and the, the sort of KPIs that you want to reach are not just... Uh, not just how many people saw the Instagram post or the tweet or whatever it is. Um, is it more about being real, uh, having engagement, um, knowing that that influencer's followership is, is going to believe the influencer because they, they are authentic in the way that they tell their stories and the brands that they connect with. So I think you first need to work out what it is that you want to achieve. And then is it tick the box? Or is it is it to create real change? Um, and I think those are the two facets that you you, you need you need to look at there. Uh, I think there's nothing worse than uh, seeing an influencer post where you can obviously see this is totally a script. This was basically mark brand manager, a marketing manager. Here you go, please read this. So in that instance, um, how do brands give you the freedom to create an authentic content where? you maintain the trust of your audience and have control over the campaign as well as the branding message, exactly what you said, how to create that authenticness in terms of your values and the brand values. 
I think this is one of the most important questions. And the reason for that is because brands should not be dictating to influencers what the content is that they create and the content they put out there. I think to be effective in the messaging and to be effective in the campaigns, you need to listen to the influencer because they know their followers. They know what their followers are all about. So to create content and to have the freedom to create content in a way that you can tell. And I, I, I go back to storytelling because that's what it's all about, right? We tell stories. So if you can tell a story with that brand and you can do it in a way that you know your readership are going to going to listen to you or believe you because it's true, then, then isn't that better for the brand at the end of the day? Um, I've, I've had campaigns that I've said no to uh, where the marketing managers or the PR teams come with a list and the list goes, you need to do three Instagram posts and one tweet. And, and, and like that's, that's not how it works, actually. Um, we know our audiences. We know, uh, we engage with them on a daily basis. We know what will work. So I think it's important to listen to the influencers and, and that's going to get the, the best result from the campaigns that you have. Okay, I love that brand advice that you mentioned and I hope a lot of marketing managers are actually listening. Also, what I want to understand and um, is how, do you, how important do you think disclosing a sponsored content is as a content creator? It's my pet hate and not to disclose when people don't disclose. I find it that it's so irresponsible um, to your followers. It's irresponsible to the brands. Uh, internationally, they have laws against this. So internationally, as someone who's online, you're, you're a content creator if you have one follower or if you have one million. You are a content creator because you're creating content. And if you're not being honest uh, about the fact that that content is either paid for or gifted, you're being completely irresponsible to your followers. Because you could be then, an influencer could then go, oh, I, I love this brand. It's an incredible brand. You should buy this brand. And, and then the next week, they, they move on to another brand and, and you follow them because you believe that, they, 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 I want that lipstick or I want this or whatever it is. Um, with that little tag of knowing that it's either gifted or it's, uh, it is sponsored content, you're able to then make a different decision when you see that. You're able to go, cool, hold on. Uh, this might not be Brent's favorite, I don't know, phone. Uh, that might not be Brent's favorite phone. He was paid for that, so should it be my favorite phone? It does make the world of difference. And, and I also think what's really cool is when I see brands that are not sponsoring me for posts, when I do posts about things that I really love and I'm able to put it out there that it's not sponsored and I absolutely love this. This is not a sponsored post. It makes it so much more greater for the audience because then they're like, oh my God, I, I actually love that too. And you're being honest. So pet hate of mine and I do see influencers in South Africa do it. And I just think to myself, oh, uh, you should be putting that hashtag sponsored or hashtag gifted or hashtag ad and just let your followers know it's a more responsible way um, to be, be promoting these brands. Wow, I love the passion and that you answer that question. You really see it as a pet peeve. Um, so I think also let's talk about the term influencers. You mentioned content creators, storytellers. Um, do you think we should do away with the term in itself in terms of influencers? What should we call them? All right, so at the beginning of this year, I was invited to a conference in Germany, uh, DW, the DW Media Forum, which is like the CNN. D DW is like the CNN of Europe. And they do this massive media forum every year. And I was invited to be on three different panel discussions uh, while I was there. And, and pre-DW, I had a set bio that I would send when I do keynotes or, or, or sort of panel discussions. And, and my PA sent it to the team. And in that, it said, Brent is a... Journalist, motivational speaker, ba, 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 and an influencer, but he hates that term. Uh, in my first panel discussion, they introduced me that way, and I'm so used to it. Like I didn't even think twice. Uh, that panel was all about constructive journalism and sharing good news. And at the end, we had a Q&A session, and one of the journalists in the room, uh, perhaps they were an influencer, they, they put up their hand and they said, Brent, I loved what you said in, in your talk, um, but I don't understand why you say you hate the, the term influencer like it comes with a great uh, responsibility you you're on the public stage where you are influencing people and a lot of people work really hard 
to get that term attached to them. It's their job. It's what they want to do. It's what they want to be when they grow up. So you sort of saying that you don't like the term, it takes away the fact that it's something that some people aim to be. And I think that's important. And I took that criticism head on. And I, and I believe that it is, uh, it's a beautiful term. You're able to influence people in a good way, hopefully, um, and, and show them incredible brands and products and experiences. And it is a job now. So, so whether you call yourself an influencer or a creator or a storyteller, whatever it, whatever it is, um, you can be whoever you want to be. And I, I go back to this, this thing that, that I was reminded of, and I, I say it often. Um, if someone's doing something that they absolutely love and they're not hurting anybody in the process, never, ever be the reason someone stops dancing. In fact, you should learn to dance with them. And I think that's so important. So if someone loves the, the term influencer, don't, don't make them hate it. Don't take that away from them. Um, and if they're aiming to be an influencer, what a lack of job. Like, like go for it. Um, what a cool thing for you to, you to do. I love that. Let people be what they want to be, okay? Like, let them be authentic. I want to switch uh, gears to a little bit more of your experience with working with brands. At Kantar, we're always hammering the uh, sort of points to our clients, you know, of creating a good brand experience, a good customer experience. From an influencer's perspective, um, when you work with a brand and you've had a good experience with them, are you naturally more drawn to work with that brand or use that brand later on? Yes! 100,000 million percent. Yes, that is the answer there. Um, business is all about relationships. Um, I, in my previous iteration of my life, I owned a company. We did brand activation. So I was all about working tangibly with uh, different brands to bring them al alive in different ways. Um, we did the coolest stuff the other day. So I love Facebook memories because I can look back at my life and go, this is where you were. This is what you were doing. The other day on Facebook memories, um, this brand activation that I did came up at, uh, uh, do they still call them raves? I don't even know if they call them raves, but there was something in the, that came to South Africa about 12 years ago called Sensation White. And we came up with a concept. I mean, take people that are partying, they're drinking, they, you know, they, they, what are they going to be interested in? What's going to catch their, their eye uh, to see something different? And, um, and we came up with this concept to remove a piece of the inside of a TV. So we separated a TV, removed a section of the TV, put it back together so you couldn't see what was on the screen. But if you put on polarized glasses, you would be able to see everything. Imagine that in a party atmosphere. Everybody was like, what? This is insane. That's crazy. And um, so we did really cool stuff. And, and in that business space, I realized early on that relationships are the cornerstone to anything you do in business. And, and in that previous iteration of my life, I would often work with brands that uh, maybe I didn't like the people. Um, we didn't get along. When, when it got to some of the meetings, it felt like I was going into the headmaster's office and it was never a nice feeling. Um, and so with Good Things Guy, I, I, I made an informed decision to only work with brands and people that I want to work with because it's all about relationships. Uh, the other day I tweeted and I was like, guys, such a conundrum. I'd, I've, I've become friends with um, some of my clients and I now no longer know whether to file their emails in client or friend. I don't know whether it needs to go because it's so difficult. Like you're my buddy now. And I, and I think that's, that's hugely important. Relationships are massive. And then you will keep working with the brand. You'll keep doing cool stuff with the brand because that's what it comes down to relationships are the cornerstone of every business. Uh, I love that. Have you ever partnered with a brand where you received criticism or backlash? And how did you navigate that? So I haven't. And I, and I think I'm very lucky for that. I've been very strategic about um, who I partner with. I've been very strategic about the brands that I put out there. Uh, it all fits in with who I am. We started the conversation saying that. I will say, though, that I have had altercations with um, certain agencies, one in particular, 
And, and it wasn't because of me. It was because of the way that I saw them treating the micro influencers. And I, I saw like the payment terms and it just didn't sit well with me. So because good things guys, a business, I don't, if, if I get booked for a job, I don't need to be paid immediately. It's not how, you know how business works. You can sit on 90 days, 180 days, but micro influencers can't do that. Um, the guys that are smaller, uh, some of them, that's that's their paycheck. Like they're living paycheck to paycheck. And and one agency and I, we bumped heads because I, I said that it was unfair, that the, the payment terms. And, and so I asked them to take me off their books. I said, please don't ever, ever promote me ever again. I want to work with brands that are doing good. And by supporting small businesses and helping them along their journey, like a small influencer, a micro influencer, you really are doing good. So it goes down to my ethics, my values, and I'm standing your ground. I think that's vitally important. They asked me to come back like a year later. They, they were like, please, we there's a client that wants to work with you through us. And I said, no, um, they can come direct. I love that. Like, I want to talk to you every day, like send you my email uh, and cell number so you can help me with all these things. Love it. And, love I, definitely, it. and, I, and I actually will. So that's, that's also vitally important to me. Um, I know that you're, you're speaking in jest here, but if there's someone listening to this podcast and, and you want a little bit of uh, you want a little bit of a shoulder to to lean on, if you if you need a conversation, if you're getting into the field, I've been doing this for ten years now. Um, I feel like I've got a skill set in the last decade. Um, I feel like if I can pass that on and I can help somebody's journey and make it a little bit easier, um, you know, get in contact with me because I definitely will. I'll help you. Oh my God. My smile and my tears are about to run down. <laughs> like really good news guy, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, so, <laughs> um, uh, I really now want to talk about um, how to measure the success of campaigns. You mentioned earlier KPIs and also like um, talking to what they want to achieve. I mean, yeah. in the past five years, digital has changed so much. Uh, 10 years ago, it's like totally different from now. So uh, we used to measure impressions and likes. What do you actually use as a success measure for campaigns? So for me, it, it, again, it goes back to what the client is trying to achieve, right? Um, we, we've got, and, and I'm going to speak about like good things guy here as a platform because that I'm able to measure. I, I can look at how we roll out, out a campaign, um, holistically. So a client comes to us, client wants to do an advertorial where they speak about the good work they're doing or the brand that they have and, and how that fits in with the good news of South Africa. So we develop a story or a narrative, a true narrative around the brand so we can speak about that good work that they're doing. We then would take an article and we would draft an article, write an article, put the article out there. So that's on Good Things Guy. We then take that article and we seed it onto all of our social media. So it'll be on the Facebooks and we don't, and, and I've learned Facebook, oh, that Facebook is, is not a friendly friend. Um, I learned many years ago that, that you need to fight the algorithms as hard as they're changing the algorithms. So like on Facebook, we developed very early on when we were realizing Good Things Guy was becoming a business. We don't just have a Facebook page. Uh, we've got two Facebook pages um, and then we've got a, a couple of Facebook groups that we seeded into as well because groups changed a couple of years ago and really became um, quite, quite important. It was an important aspect of Facebook. Um, so we seeded on Facebook, seeded on Instagram, seeded on LinkedIn, seeded on uh, threads. Um, we seeded all over the place. And then we also got uh, like the Good Things Guy app, the Moyo app. It goes onto all these different spaces. So we're able to collect then the impressions, the likes, the comments. We're able to give that actual feedback back to the client. How do clients measure things? Every client is different. Some clients are just happy with the exposure. Um, saying that an article was read 10,000 times or 20,000 times, they're like, that's amazing. Or a banner ad, to be able to say this banner ad was shown to X amount of people. Um, others... They want the clicks. They want to know how many, how many likes they can get or how many views they can get on the video. And for that, we come up with a real plan so that we can try to get that for the client. Usually, that plan would have ad spend in it because every social media platform is pay to play. There's no way about it. You cannot uh, put a brand out there without backing it with a little bit of money. I also want to add that it's become incredibly difficult to measure from a reporting um, aspect. 
and and there are many tools out there there that say that they can measure things but it is incredibly difficult to get those numbers um you really it's a manual process and and i would imagine for influencers it's not fun i don't enjoy it i don't enjoy having to go and and go back onto a post that you posted a month ago do you know do you know often we post i post all the time you go back a month ago <laughs> And then, and then have to go into the insights and screen grab it. And so if there's any clever person listening to this that is able to come up with a real tool that is not going to cost a small fortune because the tools out there are quite expensive, mm. especially for influencers, then, then that's a, just the thing that I think you should do. Uh, it's a great free business plan. Go, go do it. Go do it. I love that. <laughs> Okay, so talking about influencers, as you mentioned, what impact do you think, do you believe influencers can have on brands in terms of achieving those KPIs that marketers always look for? I think it's it's huge. So so influencer marketing has been around for a number of years now. And, and when used correctly, I think that it can really define a brand. It can do good things for a brand. It can elevate a brand. Um, it can do the polar opposites as well. We've seen that over the years, that where, where the wrong decisions are made, then, I don't know, people are, are burning their Bud Light bottles or whatever. So like there are, there are th scenarios where it could go horribly wrong, um, but there's also scenarios where it can, can really go right. Uh, I, I recently uh, partnered with um, SA Rugby, uh, and it was it wasn't more it wasn't a partnership it was more of, of a gift so they didn't pay me in any way but they they did actually because they gave me such a great pair of shoes um sa rugby contacted me a couple of weeks ago and they said to me we really just want to thank you for the great work that you do for the springboks every springbok game i'm there i'm well while everybody's watching the game yeah i'm drinking but i'm thinking about how am i going to write this because i need to report on this tomorrow whether good or bad and, and so I report on all the stuff that the Boca are doing. And, um, and so they contacted me a couple of weeks ago to ask me to design my own Springbok shoe, um, a Nike shoe. And, and it, it's the most beautiful. It's green and gold. And it was like yellow, so gold and white. And on the back of the left, it says RSA, no DNA. And on the back of the right, it says Boca. And it's just like, it's the coolest shoe. And there is only one in the whole world. So they chose 10 different celebs in South Africa. I think Anele was one of them that also got her own shoe. And they made us each our own shoe. Like we have our own shoe. And I put that video up. On, on all my social media that everybody got to see it. And the, the videos did really well organically. And then you know that the brand is partnering well when you don't need to pay, um, that, that it's doing really well. And I, I think it was two days later, um, the the agency, they they sort of alluded to the fact that one of the book, I, I can't say who it was, but they emailed SA Rugby and they were like, I saw Brent's video and I also want a pair. Like, how does he have a pair and I don't have a pair? So I think when, when brands do it correctly and they use influencers in the correct way, it can really do great things for the brand. Okay, so we're getting close to the end, but I really want to talk to you some more. And I'm sure there's some brands out there who actually want to do the same. So how do they actually get in touch with you and how do they potentially partner with you? And what should their pitch be? So this, uh, th here's advice for influencers, and, and it's important. If brands want to get in touch with me, it's as easy as searching for Brent Lindeque anywhere, and you will find me, or Good Things Guy. Richard Mulholland, a really good friend of mine, um, he told me to change my Twitter handle, which used to be Razzle Monster. I, I was Razzle Monster on Twitter. I was this, that, this, that, this. And he said, you're becoming a brand. It was, it was the start of this. He said, you're becoming a brand. You got to make it as easy as possible for people to find you. Simple. So I'm Brent Lindeque everywhere, whether that's on Facebook or the Instas or the TikToks, and you will find me. Uh, my email address is, is available online. So if you Google it, you'll find that as well. And Good Things Guy is exactly the same. It's that simple. What do people pitch? Whatever you want. Tell me, tell me what you want to do as a brand and how you want to work with either Good Things Guy or Brent Lindeque. Tell me about the good stuff that you're doing, because that's what that's what we like to know. And, um, and yeah, we'll, we'll take it from there. Sounds amazing. Brent, thank you so much for joining us. It has been an absolute pleasure. But before we let you go, we always like to ask our guests a few more general questions just to get a glimpse into what interests you. So I would love to know, who is your favorite influencer and perhaps the best campaign they've done with a brand? 
Oh, um, look, there is, there's so many in the world. Um, but the one that really started my influencer career was Casey Neistat, who, who is, you could arguably say, the best storyteller on YouTube. And, and at one stage, he had an MTV show, and he had this, and he had that, but it really has grown his YouTube and his YouTube following. And, and he had a, a video that he put out, and you can find it. It's, it's on his YouTube. It's called do what, do what You Can't or Do What They Say You Can't. And it's all about being an influencer, being a creator, being a storyteller, and, and doing what other people say you can't. Because we're living in the greatest time where all you need is a cellular telephone and a Wi-Fi connection, and you can create content, whether that's writing or, or video or podcasting or whatever it is, you can create it and you can put it out onto all these social media platforms and you can share your beautiful craft with the world. And sometimes those things that you do, the things that you put out there can take you to the most amazing places. I fed a homeless person 10 years ago. I created what has become South Africa's top good news site. And last year I got an email from Harpo asking me if I'd like to have lunch with Oprah. Like that, that is, is content creation, storytelling, and, and you being able to craft something that can really take you places and change your life. Amazing. Brent, again, thank you so much for joining us. Your infectious message of positivity and good energy just resonates so well. And that's why we've loved you for over 10 years. <laughs> so thank you again. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in. For more information, you can follow Insights by Kantar on LinkedIn and X. We would love to hear from you. So please leave us a review and remember to subscribe on Spotify, Apple or YouTube so that you never miss an episode. Until next time. Bye.